Para empezar, para empezar quisiera agradecer a los organizadores, al juez Baltasar Garzón y sobre todo al profesor Slomo Ben Ami, con el que he estado en contacto antes de venir aquí. Muchísimas gracias por haberme invitado y haberme dado la oportunidad de estar hoy aquí para compartir con todos ustedes algunas ideas sobre la jurisdicción universal. Uh, of contemporary universal jurisdiction and <coughs> then make some remarks uh, about, <coughs> about how I view the possibility of making universal jurisdiction uh, uh, stronger and more present in our uh, contempor contemporary societies. I will start with a caveat <coughs> by professional uh, inclination. I'm a defense attorney. I generally represent persons charged with serious crimes. And as you do, I believe that we, all defendants are entitled to competent legal representation and due process. Uh, by personal bent and by personal value, I'm always conscious of the potential in courts of law, and particularly in criminal courts, for miscarriages, miscarriages of justice. A miscarriage of justice is a case in which an innocent person is convicted or a guilty person is given a sanction disproportionate in harshness to the, serious, to the seriousness of his or her crime. Of course, I believe in good criminal courts, and I think there is an important place, an essential place for universal jurisdiction. But I must say that I start with the preliminary idea that criminal processes even in the best courts, are subject to defects and errors, and that it is our job not only to, to create courts and give them jurisdiction, but also to make sure that there are sufficient barriers to conviction so that the number of miscarriages of justice is minimized. We must always be conscious of the fact that even the best system can never eliminate all the potential defects in adjudicating. This applies to international courts and to state courts exercising local jurisdiction and, of course, universal jurisdiction. Thus, I approach the idea of jurisdiction with a sober sense of a legal realist who must know that the theory of the law is never purely found in the operation of the law and that we must be careful in subjecting people to jurisdiction because of the potential for miscarriages. That's just a personal statement, which I think will be reflected in, you'll see, I think, that it will be reflected in comments that I have uh, about where universal jurisdiction can go. Um, of course, we know uh, that universal jurisdiction in contemporary period has emerged from a commitment to put responsibility on those who have committed grave acts against mankind and to prevent impunity. The emergence of universal jurisdiction is in intimately linked with the attempt to establish international standards in humanitarian law following World War II. We know that universal jurisdiction recognizes implicitly that Certain states are too weak or for political reasons not motivated to bring to trial persons who are suspected of committing heinous crimes against humanity. I do not think there is any need in this forum, uh, not in Spain, uh, but many of you are experts in this field, uh, and I don't think my contribution would be to give a list of the cases investigated in Europe the many cases under the authority of universal jurisdiction. We know that during the contemporary period, universal jurisdiction took root in the early 1990s and expanded 
for about 10 years and thereafter came under heavy political pressure. European legislatures in Belgium, the UK, Spain, passed new legislation to harness it in and limit its use. Presently, we must say, universal jurisdictions comes under heavy negative pressure and its future is unclear. I think we have gathered here today to try to understand how to, in the future to uh, enhance the efficacy of universal jurisdiction and therefore it is our task to think about what we might do in respect to universal jurisdiction that would uh, strengthen it. Now, qu quickly, uh, we can mention, of course, the Belgium law of 1993, uh, in which we know that there was universal jurisdiction for crimes against humanity and genocide, and that law was used to prosecute among others, Rwandan defendants. In 2003, the Belgian law was amended, limiting the court's jurisdiction uh, to war crimes in which the accused is a resident or victim, or the victim has lived in Belgium three years, or there is a treaty obligation. This has led in Belgium to the undoing, for the most part, of universal, universal jurisdiction that in the past, had brought highly publicized investigations to public attention, including the case of, of course, against Ariel Sharon in regard to Sabra and Shatila. This case, as others in universal jurisdiction, the Sharon case, was also stopped due to uh, immunity granted to heads of state. Spain, uh, enacted legislation in 1985, as you know, with a list of offenses, including, of course, genocide and terrorism and others. In 2009, Spain expanded the list of offenses. However, in addition, the amendment specified uh, that the alleged perpetrators must be in Spain or the victims were of Spanish nationality or there was some other connecting link to Spain. In addition, of course, the amendment specified that if there were any other proceedings going on in other places, then Spain would forego. You also know, I think you've heard about this, or you'll hear more about it from others that know more about it here, that in February of 2014, the Spanish Congress of Deputies approved another amendment to the Universal Jurisdiction statute, statute of Spain and added requirements uh, saying that uh, the prosecution would be possible uh, only if the accused individual is a Spanish citizen or a foreign citizen who is habitually resident in Spain or was found in Spain and whose extradition has been denied by Spanish authorities. In respect to, that's in respect to war crimes, in respect to torture and disappearances, only if the prospective defendant is a Spanish citizen or the victims were, uh, at the time of the event, Spanish citizens, and the persons accused of the crime in Spanish territory. So this, just to kind of generalize without going into the details, there was a citizenship requirement added in 2014. As I understand, there are currently uh, at least 12 cases pending uh, in the Spanish courts. Uh, there's, there are very big questions uh, about the application, legal controversy about how this law is to be applied. Uh, I won't go into that, uh, but what we can say as a general conclusion in respect to Spain, Belgium, and also in respect to the United Kingdom, that the changes have uh, taken much of the authority out of universal jurisdiction. And uh, I want to quote from a colleague 
who wrote about this, uh, Professor D David Lubin of Georgetown uh, Law School, who has written about this in the past. Uh, he wrote that there is a dismal proposition that the momentum for international criminal law seems to be gone in its success story, starting with the creation of the military tribunals at Nuremberg and Tokyo, and culminating in the adoption of the Rome Statute has come to a close. This is what uh, uh, Professor Lubin said, and the observers point to a range of, ph of phenomenon, the pairing back of universal jurisdiction, both criminal and civil, the strong reassertion of official immunity, the diversion of attention and funding to other issues on the world, gender, uh, tensions between the International Criminal Court and Africa, and the growing frustration even among supporters of international criminal justice. Uh, Professor Lubin also refers to um, research done by uh, Professor Maximo Langer, who I think is in the audience or present, uh, whose research uh, sh has shown that out of a thousand modern universal jurisdiction complaints, he writes, only 32 have ever gone to trial. Um, on this background, uh, I want to, to try to explore from both a, a theoretical viewpoint and from a kind of legal sociological viewpoint uh, what we uh, might think about doing in respect to universal jurisdiction in the 21st century at a bridging point from what was a relatively strong presence uh, to the point now where the amendments, the politically motivated amendments in the leading countries have cut back universal jurisdiction. Uh, we can see that as a phase uh, in a dynamic uh, concern with universal jurisdiction. And there's certainly no reason to think uh, or come to the conclusion that this is the end of the story. The question is, where will the story go now? And we, as uh, citizens, as professionals, as judges, as lawyers, um, as activists, can have an impact on this. Um, I'm worried about going over too much time, so I'm going to perhaps skip some of what I wanted to say. I will, because um, I want to get to the, the, the heart of my comment about the future. Um, we know, uh, of course, that universal jurisdiction uh, in its purest form sets out mainly one uh, condition for taking jurisdiction, which is the seriousness of the crime. Genocide, <coughs> war crimes, human rights crimes. There's always the question of what is included, of course, uh, but the point is uh, in the pure universal jurisdiction, there are few procedural preconditions for taking jurisdiction other than the serious, there are no, essentially no preconditions, except for the seriousness uh, of the crime. Now, uh, when we uh, look at this, uh, the reaction that we've had recently, uh, that I would say that the reformations and the limitations on jurisdiction have emerged from two different factors, and I think we should separate out these factors in order to try to think about uh, what can be done. One is what I would call the realpolitik factor, meaning uh, that simply the desire of potential defendants and states to escape uh, sanctions. And the other is a concern uh, with legitimacy a, what I would say, an authentic and genuine concern of, uh, in, in respect to whether or not courts uh, exercising universal, universal jurisdiction have the kind of legitimacy uh, that is necessary in order uh, to operate on the worldwide platform. These two limiting considerations have taken into account uh, the changes uh, that have occurred in the legislation. 
Now, the way, let me just kind of summarize this to move on. I think the way that uh, states have dealt with the problem of legitimacy uh, in the amendments which have been passed uh, in recent years is by cutting back jurisdiction and by putting on these requirements of connectedness. Connectedness, that is, the nuxus or linkage between uh, the territory, the court, and uh, the actors, so that when you have citizenship, residency uh, of victims, or these kinds of considerations, the legislators would say, we're giving legitimacy by uh, restraining and cutting back jurisdiction. A, of course, there are other ways of uh, dealing with questions of legitimacy, and I want to speak about those. Uh, now, I want to ask the following question uh, in respect to the procedural act, uh, the, the procedural aspect of universal jurisdiction, and that is um, whether uh, the idea of a court that can operate beyond the territory in which it has authority and in respect to persons who have no or almost no connection with that uh, territory, whether that idea is essentially repugnant to the legal communities uh, which have responsibility for creating courts. Is there a sense in the legal community, among judges, among lawyers, that taking jurisdiction of the kind that we're talking about here is somehow contrary to the very nature of legal institutions. And I want to uh, raise an example uh, that indicates that the answer to that question is no. There is not a general consensus that taking jurisdiction through courts, legal jurisdiction through courts, is somehow contrary to the basic notion of legal precepts recognized by uh, the community of, of, of countries which uh, might consider this. Uh, my my um, example here is drawn from the United States Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Some of you may know about this act, others not. This uh, piece of legislation in the United States uh, gives jurisdiction to federal prosecutors in the United States to investigate and prosecute cases of bribery which take place outside of the United States um, and uh, uh, in respect to uh, transactions in foreign countries. Now, I'll give a, an example of how this works. In March of this year, a wealthy Ukrainian businessman was arrested by Austrian authorities in Vienna <clears throat> at the request of the United States Department of Justice based on this <clears throat> on the suspicion that one of his companies had paid bribes to an Indian official in Delhi in order that this Ukrainian company of his would be able to get a contract in India uh, for, for providing uh, chemical production. This person uh, was arrested, held in jail in Austria, and has now been released uh, as long as he, as he stays in Austria on bail for 125 million euro. In this case, and, and here's what I want to draw attention to in particular, the offense took place in India. The suspected perpetrator, the Ukrainian, acted from European headquarters, and he had never set foot in his life in the United States. There was no direct damage in the United States. There's no conventional jurisdiction to the United States in this case. What gives the United States federal courts the jurisdiction to indict a Ukrainian giving a bribe or suspected of giving a bribe in India in a transaction uh, which did not relate to the United States? The answer is the fact that in order to make uh, the wire transfer of funds from the Ukraine to India, because the funds were denominated in dollars, the wire transfer going through New York has given the United States courts jurisdiction to arrest, to extradite, and to put on trial, if there is sufficient evidence, this Ukrainian businessman. So 
What we have here is the United States using what looks like universal jurisdiction. What we can draw from this, of course you can, it's, 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 the, it's the United States, it's not clear that it would work with others, uh, but these are uh, United States lawyers, United States judges. Uh, this must mean something about universal jurisdiction. The point is that at the very time that many in the international community are critical of European states attempting to take extraterritorial jurisdiction over serious human rights offenses, one of the most central state actors on the, in the globe is using extraterritorial jurisdiction or something like very close to universal jurisdiction, if not actually universal jurisdiction, to prosecute uh, foreigners uh, for bribery, for foreign bribery. This is a phenomenon that shows that in, contempor in contemporary society, the idea of courts taking legal jurisdiction over foreigners with no connectedness, uh, no links to the state of jurisdiction, is a form of jurisdiction that is, in another way, actually growing. The United States is, in different ways, pressing to expand universal jurisdiction, not just diplomatic pressure, but the use of courts. This counter trend for bribery is very important in trying to locate what is the real source of opposition to universal jurisdiction in recent history. The opposition is not so much to the idea of taking jurisdiction over foreigners, but rather in taking jurisdiction over foreigners for human rights violations. Now, uh, about legitimacy. This brings me to the issue of uh, legitimacy. I've said that there are different sources of opposition to universal jurisdiction. One is the straightforward goal of escaping sanctions. Um, but there is a genuine concern with the nature of the process. We know that all courts prosecuting crime have to contend with issues of, of legitimacy. It is a basic concept that expresses the perceived willingness of a defendant and the defendant's community to accept the authority of a court to make a judgment. My view is that states can and should have some form of universal jurisdiction, but both the justifying principle of jurisdiction and the very ability to pre preserve such jurisdictions requires that great attention be given to uh, legitimacy. Without this, any realist knows that the jurisdiction of the court will be undermined. Now, in what ways uh, uh, do I think that um, this concern with legitimacy that I'm talking about should be better focused in the future? Uh, when an Israeli soldier conducts military operations, including bombing of identified targets, and there is a charge of unjustified collateral damage, the question of whether Israelis should submit to jurisdiction if they have a choice, and what should be the attitude of the state of Israel is dependent very much on how the legitimacy in terms of procedural, the, 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 procedurals, the procedural aspects of the process are presented and viewed. Now I want to give particular attention to two questions of due process whose importance for granting procedural legitimacy have been, in my view, under-attended to. And in fact, uh, here will be my central comment. 
on the question of how the international community might enhance the acceptability of universal jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis those who are critical of it and vis-a-vis -vis those who have the political power to limit it. Um, in criminal jurisdiction, as a general matter, investigation and prosecution are two separate stages. A fundamental question in any criminal justice system is what are the evidentiary preconditions to move from one stage to the next? The, questions, the question asked at the investigation stage is how much reliable and credible information there is about the occurrence of the, f of the alleged facts that, if proved, would constitute commission of crime. The same question arises, how much evidence there is, when a court has to decide to arrest or to hold in pretrial detention a person who is facing the possibility of prosecution. Such investigations are formidable tasks when the sites of events are very far away and the facts relevant to the question of actual criminal responsibility are complex. In this context, a major question that faces any system of criminal procedure is coming to terms with the question of how much evidence must be collected before action can be taken. My point here is that more attention should be, has to be given to the investigated stage and to the publication of investigative results and the giving of opportunity to adversarial, adversarially contend with investigation results, results before any prosecutory actions can take place. Investigative processes must be given much more emphasis and much greater weight and constitute a greater barrier, excuse me, barrier, barrier to detention, to prosecution, uh, than I think the international community understands uh, that exists today. And, and I put the emphasis on understands because it's not just the question of what actually happens, but the question of what is published as the rules that bind courts who engage in international investigations in respect to uh, the procedures which must be complied with before, not prosecution, but before starting an investigation, before arresting a person, and before uh, giving an order of pretrial uh, pre detention. Now, uh, I'll just take do I have five more minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. Do we know, in a clear enough way, those of us who are concerned with universal jurisdiction, what are the procedural rights of suspects at the initial stage of an investigation of a person suspected of an offense uh, of, with universal jurisdiction? And are these rights appropriately defined by special legislation? What is the evidentiary threshold for opening an investigation? Or the barrier? I'm drawing from Professor Miriam Damascus uh, of, Yale, uh, of, of Yale Law School, who wrote a path-breaking, I think, uh, article on entitled Barriers, Evidentiary Barriers to the Use of the Criminal Process. What are the evidentiary barriers uh, for drawing any kind of conclusion in a report that there has been serious human rights offenses? What is the barrier, the evidentiary barrier to arrest? What is the evidentiary barrier to detention? What is the evidentiary barrier to conviction? In looking at these questions, all, not all of which I can talk about, I am saying that it is very important to the international community, to potential defendants, to states whose citizens may be defendants, to understand the nature of the due process in these kinds of investigations. And I don't think that issue has been given enough attention. 
uh, I would like to talk just quickly about two of these. One is investigation and the other is pretrial detention. Uh, I think that uh, investigation processes are extremely essential to the whole issue of using universal jurisdiction and that a, a more attention has to be given to uh, this and uh, I would go on and suggest that indeed we should view the investigation as a kind of separate uh, autonomous, potentially autonomous issue in using universal jurisdiction. Recognizing that not only prosecution, but investigation and publication of an investigative report can have an important impact on facilitating the norms that underlie the concerns of universal jurisdiction. In other words, there doesn't necessarily have to be a prosecution for universal jurisdiction to do something very good. It doesn't mean, on the other hand, that I'm saying that there are not to be prosecutions. But what I'm saying is that uh, if we put more attention on the investigation stage in the international form, saying that the investigation has a whole set of due process rules and that defendants and that uh, the defense attorneys and states who have an interest in these cases, if they understand that the investigation is an independent, potentially independent procedure, who, uh, and, and at the end of which a report will be published, uh, and that this report will have an independent status, it will lift uh, into greater view and make more important the um, investigation process, and it will also require us to attend to the rules uh, that will be applied in investigation uh, I, I, uh, and, and make them more public and therefore in the series of events uh, enhance legitimacy of courts who do uh, universal jurisdiction in the eyes of the potential defendants. Uh, now this is closely related and I will uh, this is closely related to the issue of pretrial detention. Uh, perhaps in, um, in, uh, in those countries and those uh, uh, persons who are the potential subjects of international, of universal jurisdictions, and who look on the Spanish court, and who look on the Belgium court, when it had the international jurisdiction, and on the UK, when it had real universal jurisdiction. The major issue in the minds, and I could say this about Israelis, I think, and I'm sure it applies to others, the major issue was the question of arrest. Could these people travel and um, would they be um, arrested and held in jail for um, some period of time while the investigation takes place while a prosecutorial decision is being made, uh, and um, this prospect of the possibility of being arrested and uh, the process of investigation and consideration of prosecution taking place thereafter, uh, and, not, and these people not be granted bail, uh, is a tremendous negative factor. Of course, you may say this is the teeth of international, of universal jurisdiction, but it's a tremendous negative factor for getting a more, I would call it, socio-legal acceptability uh, for universal jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, we have to ask the question, uh, and we have to know what the rules are about pretrial detention. Now, I understand in a conversation uh, I, I had uh, 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 just now uh, about pretrial detention uh, uh, that uh, 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 there are some people in the Spanish jails today who've been waiting for trial for two years. Um, uh, Judge uh, Garcon mentioned that to, to me. Uh, these, I think, are 
perhaps these are drug cases, I'm not sure, but um, the prospect of a person who has uh, the legal right to a presumption of innocence, uh, of being arrested and held, held in jail uh, for a long period of time before uh, he or she is able to put on a full defense and, and, and before um, the, uh, a, a question, the litigative question of whether the person should be in jail has been fully um, uh, heard by the courts is a, is a very serious issue uh, that um, I don't believe there is enough, um, there, there are rules about that which are public and which uh, make clear to the international community uh, what, when the pretrial detention um, a, a power will be used and when bail will be, be granted. So if we, take, uh, if we take for an example the Israeli situation, if the rule is that the, uh, the Israeli who, um, in regard to whom a complaint has been filed, it comes to Spain and, arrest, and is arrested, if the rule is that that person stays in jail for uh, some long period of time while the process of justice are taking place, and these are often slow, we know it from our own internal courts, I can say that in most countries, there are lots of people in jail, in pretrial detention f for months and years uh, uh, who before they're brought to, to court and their trials are completed. So the question in international jurisdiction is, will someone, could be uh, from any other country arrested from the United States, will that person have an, some, uh, some special, procedural right to be released uh, to his home country on, uh, on, on condition of some kind of guarantee for return, or is that person going to stay in the jail for a long period of time? Now, if the rule is that anyone in respect to whom a complaint has been filed uh, will be held in jail until the completion of his proceeding, uh, uh, this is a very, I, I think this is a very problematic aspect uh, and it may not be the rule. I don't know the rules throughout uh, the areas where there have been universal jurisdiction on this issue. But the very fact that these rules are not clear and are not made clearly part of uh, the set of procedures that relate to universal jurisdiction means that there's going to be a, a serious problem of legitimacy uh, in respect to those countries who uh, are potentially uh, defendants in these processes. Now I've come to a conclusion uh, and I want to say the following. Uh, I think that the investigation has to be seen, uh, oh, it, there, there can be very positive effects on issue of legitimacy by uh, placing the investigation in a framework in which it has some independent meaning, uh, that uh, the investigation and the re publication of a report about a human rights com complaint uh, is, is an important procedure and can have an impact on enhancing uh, protection of human rights. And therefore, we need a set of procedural rules around when investigations start and what we do in those investigations. And the second issue I think that I want to focus on is that of pretrial detention. You know, how do we create a system in which defendants, in regard to whom there is a presumption of innocence, where the filing of a complaint and the opening of an investigation does not strip these people of their rights. We know that, we all accept that, I think. But the message in the international community about how much that will be protected by universal jurisdiction is not clear enough in my view. In closing, uh, let me make the kind of following, um, share with you the following um, uh, dilemma, which many of us probably have. It, we know that every armed conflict and uh, every conflict of survival, and there are many of those around the world, results in extreme abuses 
And these abuses must be attended to. And there should not be impunity for people who commit these abuses. That is a commitment which many of us have, perhaps all of us in this room have. On the other hand, at the same time, we have a commitment, a very strong commitment to uh, protecting potential uh, in, uh, suspects and potential defendants from the possible uh, um, abuses of criminal justice, which also occur in every country, in every place around the world. And if we have these double commitments, uh, which I certainly have, uh, we need uh, to figure out a way in which to address both at the same time. Uh, perhaps paradoxically, the greater the procedural barriers are to arrest, detention, and prosecution, the more likely we are to have an international community and nation states which accept universal jurisdiction. Thank you. Channel, uh, channel three. Channel three. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, English Channel? Number five. English Channel is number five. Can you hear me now? Good. Right, there are several questions for Professor Kenneth Mann. Some of these questions are about the relationship between Palestine and Israel and the permanent conflict. And they are asking you about your opinion, your opinion about how you how the end of violation of human rights could be guaranteed from the state of Israel towards uh, the people of Palestine, and whether that, that moves on to another question. So the object of uh, u universal ju jurisdiction. And then if Israel enjoys or recognizes or acknowledges inter, uh, juri, uh, universal jurisdiction, whether Israel acknowledges or uh, recognizes universal jurisdiction. Uh, the first question um, about, about preventing human rights violations in Israel and Palestine. I think the first answer is clearly that there must be very vigorous prosecution by Israel and by the Palestinian community. Both communities, uh, Israel and Palestine, are investigating and doing something. Whether they're doing enough, probably not. Neither side is probably doing enough to uh, attend to these questions, these problems. And uh, I myself, and I know many other NGOs in Israel, uh, we are lobbyists. Um, we engage in litigation in the courts. Uh, we engage in, uh, in law reform in order to attempt to achieve more protection within, within Israel. And I, I know from colleagues and associates in the Palestinian community, that the same is occurring there. Is it enough? No. Uh, the second question about uh, universal jurisdiction in Israel. <clears throat> uh, 
there is, uh, first of all, there's uh, extraterritorial, juris extraterritorial jurisdiction, which of course is not universal jurisdiction, but to give a background, uh, the um, criminal code of Israel grants jurisdiction to Israeli courts to prosecute Israelis who are suspected of committing criminal offenses outside of Israel by virtue of their citizenship. <clears throat> uh, and secondly, um, it grants international uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction to prosecute persons who commit crimes outside of Israel against Israelis. So this is a kind of conventional connectedness. It's not universal jurisdiction. There is a clause in the criminal code which allows uh, prosecutions for uh, violations of the torture statute, which Israel is a party to. Um, it's a discretionary, uh, like all the prosecution powers within Israel, it's a, a discretionary authority. Uh, I don't know of a case in which <clears throat> that universal aspect of Israeli jurisdiction has been used. <clears throat> Well, there is one question about the attitude, the attitude of the U.S., which self-considers itself, considers itself to act in many cases that are affecting, that are impacting the U.S., but also, the U.S. does not act in other cases, and especially the U.S. does not take into account the requirements of foreign courts whenever the U.S. is investigating people uh, from the US, U.S. nationals. So, well, I'd like to add that the example that you gave us about federal judges, federal judges that understand that you know why a transfer going through the U.S. territory, it is good enough link to consider that the U.S. has is competent to uh, investigate a case of bribery. But on the other hand, for instance, the U.S. does not recognize or does not acknowledge that a tra court so, or that a, a case of Spain, you know, where we investigate tortures in Guantanamo or crimes of war resulting in the death of Spanish journalists at Iraq, Iraq war, uh, but has been shot by U.S. military people. So that contraposition. So on the one hand, it's about extending or enlarging jurisdiction according to the example that you gave us. But then this other case where they are denying any possibility or uh, to intervene in international crimes. In both cases, we are discussing international crimes. I, I, you're, you're absolutely correct about that. I mean, I agree with your comment, and the question is, what do we draw from that? What, what lesson do we draw from that? And I think that my point was that uh, we, we know that power is uh, polit political power, military power, and the power of the United States, uh, countries with uh, this standing, the few that there are, d often do what they want uh, uh, in, in whatever way they think is best without regard for <clears throat> norms in other places. This is a serious problem. What I wanted to say was that uh, in uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, what we find is a very inter interesting example of <clears throat> the participation and agreement of the legal community that international jurisdiction can be extended so far without violating some um, constitutional concepts so that if it were just the United States uh, using its military to go and you know, do something about foreign corruption, whether we would say, well, that, that's just an issue of power. But here we have in, in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act um, the, um, the, the participation of what we generally consider to be a legitimate uh, uh, judicial um, system uh, a court system in which uh, uh, the judges who are uh, both unconstitutional in the United States Supreme Court and other uh, federal courts uh, view 
and I think this is very important to, to, to use as an example, view the notion of this kind of jurisdiction as appropriate, uh, but appropriate use of uh, legal power. It's not political power, it's legal power. And therefore, if you can use it in the corrupt practices uh, context, you can also use it in the human rights practice. That's what I'm, I'm saying. That, that's an argument. It's not, that's obviously not what the United States has done. <clears throat> Another question is whether you think, if you think that the view of the U.S. regarding jurisdiction, regarding the International Criminal Court, and not refusing to accept it, would you think that this is similar to what, to the view or to the position of Israel regarding that court? And for what reason each country, or both these countries as well as other countries, refuse to accept this international criminal court to prosecute crimes such as, uh, well, genocide, etc., crimes against uh, human rights? There is any one reason. Um, <clears throat> I think that there are a number of reasons. Um, <clears throat> in, in both the United States and Israel, there are sectors of the political, um, of the government, of the political uh, system, of the political uh, persons in political power who for, for reasons of uh, what I called real politics, simply not wanting to accept that a, a foreign jurisdiction will judge them under any, um, in, in, in any form of proceeding. I mean, it, it is <clears throat> an idea of uh, rejecting the, the notion that what it, what, what's it, uh, what it does, what government repre representatives do, what its agents do, should not be submitted to um, assessment or, or judgment out, outside of their own countries. That's one form of opposition, which I think is shared by Israel and the United States. <clears throat> uh, I, I would note that the Israel, um, Israeli representatives were deeply involved in the uh, deliberations and the writing of uh, the, if you will, constitution of the International Court of Justice. Uh, so that there's another sector of Israelis who view uh, positively uh, a, an international criminal jurisdiction. Uh, and these are not the Israelis who are in political power. And in the United States, I think the situation is the same. But I wanted to add uh, that uh, there are, <clears throat> in both places, and I think in other countries where uh, there's opposition to universal jurisdiction, <clears throat> a real concern about a due process. And what I wanted to say here and emphasize, and I'll take the opportunity again, <clears throat> is that those questions can be addressed and maybe if those questions, uh, we, the international community, addresses those questions in a more vigorous way, uh, the balance will be tilted in some countries who will then say, now that we understand you know, what are the rights of a person who's arrested and maybe put in pretrial detention, we understand this very well, it will tilt the balance. I mean, anything that tilts the balance and, and, and does not contradict the notion of universal jurisdiction uh, will contribute to the possibility of changing uh, the present trajectory, which has been, of course, uh, down, and it may go up. If some of these factors are tuned differently, it won't be a sweeping uh, agreement by uh, persons who have you know, views against uh, universal jurisdiction for reasons which are not necessarily connected with due process. <clears throat> A last question now. 
What do you think that there is greater agreement amongst countries in terms of accepting the principle of universal jurisdiction based on prosecution of crimes, uh, regard, for instance, uh, drug dealing, terrorism, as well as other crimes beyond their borders. However, there is not that much agreement, or most of the countries refuse to apply that principle when we are discussing the most severe uh, crimes, you know, such as war crimes, crimes against human rights. Why is there a consensus and agreement in the first case, but there is like lack of consensus in the second cases? Why, why is there agreement, a big agreement, significant agreement in the application of universal jurisdiction regarding crimes such as drug dealing, terrorism, uh, corruption, bribery, money laundering, but there is no agreement between amongst countries for more severe crimes. And then the countries kind of self-protect themselves, you know, to have impunity. Yeah, well, I think the, the, reason, the reason for that is that the crimes, uh, uh, the human rights crimes, get to the core of uh, <clears throat> political power, the use of political power, get to the very core of the use of political power uh, by police, by secret police, by military, and it goes to the very heart of the question of uh, the legitimacy of the governments. Uh, drug dealing uh, may even get to that proportion if there's corruption in the, in the, in the system such that the um, leaders of the government are involved in protecting uh, drugs. But it's much less likely that that will occur, uh, more likely that uh, the, the use of police power in all of its various forms uh, which, which result in uh, the human rights crimes uh, touch so uh, at, the, at the very um, center of the use of political power by a regime and the, uh, much, much of the opposition is regime protection, simply regime protection. Well, this, is, this is a serious problem. I, I, you know, we have no magical way of, of dealing with this. What, what, I, what I think is that and let me just offer this thought again, is that uh, if we see that some states are very much against it and other states are in favor of it, and there, there are a lot in the middle, and some of these states um, who are not supportive may change uh, their view on this if we address questions which we can address. Uh, and and uh, to, to try to strengthen the perceived a protection of the, their nationals in a setting where universal ju jurisdiction is used. What I mean by protection is uh, that, uh, and, and I think the, there's a real fear that uh, among the nationals of the countries which are likely to have their nationals subject to this, uh, these systems, and, and I'm, I'm speaking as a realist here, you know, this is, this is the way it is. It's not theory. That uh, uh, if we, we can address this question of how um, uh, someone who, who was arrested and is going to be held for a long period of time in pretrial detention as someone who is a suspect, how, how we uh, assuage the, the, the anxiety uh, which is transformed into political power among the governments that, some of the governments whose criticism of your you know, universal jurisdiction is not simply an expression of regime protection, but also uh, an expression of um, when, when do I allow my citizens who may be defendants, when do I subject them to this kind of situation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias.